We have some time for questions now, and if I may, I would like to ask the first one. You talked about uh, Hayek's relationship to the nation state and Hayek's uh, thoughts about integrating Germany into a post-war order, in a federal order. Now, if Hayek looked at uh, the state that Europe is in today, which uh, more and more resembles like a European federalist project, is that what he had in mind, or would he actually go back to um, the theory and say may maybe nation states are not such a bad thing after all? Uh, there's, there's an article in the journal, journal Critical Review by my friend Glenn Morgan from a number of years ago on Hayek and Habermas on the European Union that I recommend to anyone who's interested in this kind of question. Um, I incline, I, I think, not to go the direction that you're suggesting. The European Union, for all of its faults and flaws, and it is, after all, politics. Politics is a business of faults and flaws. The European Union has succeeded in preventing the re-outbreak of war among Germany, France, and Britain, which was absolutely crucial to its purpose at its founding. And it has, over the last several decades, successfully established a free trade zone within Europe for the first time in history. That's not to say that there isn't overreach from Brussels. That's not to say there are not economic regulations that Hayek or a Hayekian would not wish away. But after all, the same has tr been true of every nation state that has ever existed. Insofar as Hayek was a Europeanist for Acton-style reasons, then I think that we should look at the modern EU as being really strikingly compatible with what he was suggesting. Acton's views about the multinational state were that the multinational state on the model of the Habsburg Empire would prevent anyone from loving their state too much because the nation, the ethnic nation, is what attracts our natural emotional attachment. And so the existence of many nations in a state like the existence of many religions in a state gives people something to attach themselves to as against the state. That's surely true in modern Europe, despite the dreams of a handful of people in Brussels, Paris, and Berlin. The number of people who think of themselves as fundamentally Europeans in a way that would make the European state the kind of threat that Acton or Tocqueville thought the modern nation state would be uh, is trivial. And the fact that the EU doesn't have and isn't going to have in the foreseeable future significant military capacity of its own means that you're not getting any time in the foreseeable future a replication at the European level of the real threat of the democratic or of the of the nationalistic state that Hayek's talking about in 1944. It doesn't have to be pure or perfect to be successfully Hayekian in these ways. I think that it continues to be a successful solution of the problems that Hayek thought in 44. Thank you, Jacob. Well, I think um, if you ever met a European who self-identified as a European and not as some kind of other nationality, you could be fairly sure that he's German. <laughs> <laughs> but apart from that, I think we could talk endlessly about whether the European Union is not a constructivist project with which Hayek would probably have uh, some difficulty. But anyway, I don't want this to be a discussion purely about the European Union. So over to you for further questions. Yes, please. Thank you very much for that. That was quite a compelling analysis. And my apologies for the slightly convoluted nature of this question. But I wonder if um, you're downplaying Hayek's very Austrianness with regards to wanting to name the society the Acton Tocqueville Society in that the Austrian-Hungarian Empire was the most pluralistic, multi-ethnic, and in many ways free society, despite its many economic inefficiencies, to the extent that the Archduke, Otto von Habsburg, who passed away only in the last few months, was a member of the Mont Pelerin Society. And I wonder if those sort of reasonings and considerations and that sort of area of stuff had any influence on why he would pick two Catholic aristocrats to name the society? Um, 
it is it is certainly true that Hayek quite openly thought that the division of the Habsburg Empire into warring nation states in the post World War One order uh, was one of the deep sources of conflict and problem in the modern Europe of the 1940s. Um, he's open about that. When he talks about federalizing Europe and creating an integrated European order, it's partly to undo that catastrophic set of mistakes. And unquestionably, that has an emotional resonance for Hayek because it is, after all, the Vienna of his youth that has been lost. It is also true that in Acton's essay on nationality, which is one of the one of the most important statements of Acton's political theory, the Habsburg Empire figures as an example of doing things more or less right compared with the other alternatives that are on offer in an age when the democratic nationalist ideal is coming into being, um, especially in the movements for Italian and German unification. But Acton, I think, doesn't have a strong emotional relationship to Vienna. You're not going to get Hayek being an Acton enthusiast just because he loved the Vienna of his youth and he feels a kindred spirit with Acton also being attached to that. Uh, rather, you're seeing a genuine intellectual confluence. Um, I, I think that means that what you say is right, but it's not, it's not a deep psychological account. It's just a way of a, giving a genesis for Hayek's commitment to something other than the centralized nation state in a way that connects up with Acton's own views. Is, am, am, am I hearing you correctly? I think you're looking for something deeper than is needed. Well, I'm also sort of leading on the path towards discussion of subsidiarity and that interplay, because I know Wilhelm Ropke was also a founding member of the Mont Pelerin Society. And I know that those sort of terms are not, used, are not current currency within a lot of contemporary economic discourse. But I was wondering if Hayek was still nonetheless subconsciously perhaps influenced by some of those ideas of power to the locus, local level, et cetera, et cetera. Contra Adam Smith. Right. Um. I don't tend to move towards subconscious accounts when conscious accounts will seem to do the work. Um, Hayek's critique of the centralized planning state is of a piece with his completely conscious intellectual project. Um, it, it follows as straightforwardly from his 1930s contributions to economics as it does from his childhood in Vienna. And since Hayek wasn't a Catholic himself. Subsidiarity as such, which is an idea from Catholic social thought, I think is unlikely to have shown up lurking in the background for Hayek. Uh, that there were resources available to Catholics that might have been among the resources that Acton picked up on, sure. But that doesn't mean that they were lurking in Hayek's own psyche. Yeah? Thank you, Jacob. Further questions? Ooh. Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> okay, then I ask a question. But that idea of subsidiarity, isn't that eminently compatible with um, Hayek's uh, thought of dispersed knowledge? Because in the end, what Catholic social teaching talked about was really making use of that dispersed knowledge and uh, seeing that lying more or less at the local level. Here, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to avoid importing ideas from my other work outside this project. Um, subsidiarity is the doctrine that all social decisions should be made at the lowest possible level, where the lowest possible level means the level at which people are most people are able to put decisions into effect. It's my view that you cannot give non-question begging content to that doctrine. Because your view about what is the most 
local possible level isn't independent of your view on what the content of the policy will be. Different policies about the same question can or can't be implemented at a very local level. If you think that the problem you're facing requires policy A rather than policy B as a solution, then you th might think that it cannot be decided locally because policy A can only be implemented at the next level up. Moreover, I th think that subsidiarity does not give non-question begging answers to the question, who decides which level? It offers a standard for evaluation. It tells us that we can look after the fact and say, that decision was made by a more centralized level than it needed to be. <coughs> but it doesn't give us a way to answer the question at a moment in time. If I say my local government and you say your state government and they say their federal government are the most local levels possible because we disagree about what the right policy is, subsidiarity doesn't and can't give us a meaningful answer to that question. Um, so does subsidiarity draw on the Hayekian idea of dispersed information and knowledge? Well, yes and no on the account that I just gave. It purports to because it says the reason to prefer more local levels of decision making over more distant and centralized levels of decision making is because at the more local level, the people who are most affected will have the most knowledge about what suits local conditions, what should be done under those local conditions. Uh, but because it <coughs> doesn't tell us who has the information to evaluate, who can judge which is the appropriate level, who can judge what level uh, policies become possible at, um, it, it can't pull itself up by its informational bootstraps. That concept of the local level that's possible requires some information that is not itself local information. It requires some knowledge of the system as a whole without telling us where it's going to come from. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Do you think that there could be any human, any human spontaneous order in the absence of uh, human rationality and judgment? No, uh, um, but, I, but Hayek doesn't think that either. Uh, the Hayekian spontaneous order emerges out of our individual or local applications of rationality and knowledge to our local problems. And then an order emerges out of a succession of decentralized decisions and judgments like that. So uh, trial and error. Trial and error, but also the interaction of our various decentralized decisions. Mm, which are them themselves. Applications elements of. Elements in that same process. Yes. Yes, please. Thanks. Um, d did Hayek, when he, look, when he looked at uh, the state versus the market, did he spend a lot of time thinking about the corporation and the extent to which corporations would become as large and as internally planned and as multinational as they were now? And how, and how does he fit that into his, his kind of um, you know, dichotomy between spontaneous and, and planned? Well, one answer that I know that I can give is we're, that the question isn't anachronistic. It's not just a matter of how big and important and multinational corporations have now become. And one of the reasons we know that it's not anachronistic is because Hayek's compatriot, Joseph Schumpeter, someone, on whose, so, someone about whose work Hayek was very knowledgeable and deeply acquainted and admiring in many ways, Schumpeter's work is in many ways all about that. Schumpeter thinks that the end of the capitalist order will come not through revolution and not through planned destruction from above, but because the corporate form becomes gradually a more centralized, more planned, more bureaucratic structure until at the end there is almost no difference between the bureaucratic structure at the top of the corporate form 
and the bureaucratic structure of the state. And so the managers of the corporations will seamlessly become the civil servants who run the post-capitalistic economic order. Um, so I knew that that argument existed. He said very little about it. And he said very little about the corporate form in any work that I've read. Now, there are many thousands of pages from Hayek that I haven't read. But in his major works of political theory and in his major works of normative economics, there is very, very little about the corporate form as such. Um, with regard to the previous question, whether um, a order can be established without rationality, I'd like to suggest that in fact it can, because after all, man is a semi-social uh, animal um, relying on uh, um, inherited characteristics, and one of those inherited characteristics is a, a, a dominance um, between individuals that seems to apply naturally. I'm not sure what follows here. Um, let, 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 me, let me try a different cut at it. There can certainly be emergent orders in the absence of rational decision making on the part of the component parts of the order. And one of the examples that contemporary social scientists who talk about complex emergent orders often use is crystalline forms in physics. Crystals form under certain conditions from the interactions of specific local molecular bonds that then come together in one very sharp organizational moment in a way that transcends what you would see looking at the bonds one by one. Um, and the, the subsequent order is more complex than you possibly could have predicted from the individual bonds. And it's an order. It has a very clear structure to it. Um, if the natural world has emergent orders like that, then emergent orders can't depend on rationality on the part of the parts. But if the social world has emergent orders, then I'm not sure how to say those orders don't depend in some part on the decision making of the human actors who are parts of it. And I think that it is in the nature of human decision making that it is at least partly rational and planned and calculating and judgment based. Uh, we simply don't know what a human society would look like that had those elements stripped away entirely. We are partly biological, I mean, we are biological creatures, we are partly instinctive creatures. We have pre rational evolutionary holdovers. And we can look at other parts of the animal kingdom and say, we're pretty sure that those animals don't have anything we recognize as rationality. Nonetheless, here's the shape of what we anthrop anthropomorphically call the society of, say, the society of a wolf pack. Um, but human social orders don't look entirely like that. Um, am, am, am I reaching your objection? Yeah. I'd like to suggest that uh, human social orders are more complex, but aren't they really based on the same sort of thing, a hierarchical structure um, within a society? Well, they're, they're based on the things that human beings are. And human beings are partly this evolutionarily tribalistic, hierarchical, dominance-oriented great ape, and partly this language-using creature that postdates the great apes. Um, and I think we, we, we just can't neatly separate those two things. The kind of evolutionary creatures that we are is certainly shaped by our ape roots, but it's also inc incredibly strongly shaped by the subsequent advent of language. Language changed our evolutionary course in very clear ways. And what do we do with language? Well, some of the things we do with language are communicate knowledge and information and gather knowledge and information. 
Those aren't the only things we do with language, but the, those are clearly among the reasons why language was evolutionarily useful because it allowed for information and knowledge to be shared. Once I've learned that there's a rattlesnake over there behind those rocks, you don't need to go discover it for yourself, I can tell you. Um, and the accurate sharing of information and knowledge is one of the things that makes language useful for a tribalistic creature. So then to say, well, human societies are the same kinds of things as we found among the dominance-oriented, tribalistic, pre-linguistic great apes, I think that can only ever be partly right. And partly what a human social order always is, is the thing that happens among the creatures that evolved the ability to share information and knowledge in particular ways. And that means to act in accordance with reasons and knowledge. We're, we're a hybrid animal. And you're not going to be true to the, or, to the order that emerges if you neglect the hybrid character of the component parts. Thank you, Jacob. Well, I haven't seen any further questions, but I still have one. So if I may, Jacob. Please. Um, you, when you're talking about uh, the three of them, Hayek, Acton, and Tocqueville, what occurs to me is actually that they are all standing in a very localist tradition. Um, the German language uh, world has always had a very strong element of local government, both in Germany, in Switzerland, in Austria, really dating back to the Middle Ages, to free cities. If you think of um, Acton's England, that was a time, of course, when local government was at its peak in England. You can still see it in magnificent town halls all across England. <laughs> and when you think of uh, de Tocqueville and democracy in America, he was, of course, a glowing supporter of American local government. And you find lots of uh, paragraphs in his work describing how impressed he was with the kind of local government structures that he found. So it occurs to me that when looking at all three thinkers, you would really find strong support for localism. And I wonder how that would have influenced Hayek's thinking. I, I, I think that what you say is broadly right and um, is some of the direction that I was trying to push in saying Hayek's own commitment to federalist and constitutionalist orders um, is partly independent of his economic views, that there's, there's a view that he's not fully communicating about what governing structures should look like. And that is a more localist, more decentralist view about government. Um, that said, given how many thousands of pages Hayek wrote, I'm reluctant to say, well, he really meant something when he never talks about it very much. In law, legislation, and liberty, we get a story about the emergent order of law in which he does talk about the institutions. The institutions are the judiciary that has one shape rather than another shape. It is a priority for the judiciary over the legislature. Um, it's the common law judge. It's the competing system of law courts in medieval and early modern England, and so on. When he talks about the problem with the nation state, he'll talk about, he'll talk a little bit about federalism, He'll talk about multinationalism within the state. He doesn't talk about towns and cities very much. Um, okay. So you, you, you could have a very long distance influence on him, but I think you don't have a thought sitting at the forefront of his mind on it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all we have time for tonight, but I think it was a very enlightening evening. It was an evening of interpretation. And um, please join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob.